We are live, and we finished fixing our hair. We are ready to go. the The <laughs> makeup did. team, the makeup team not. has just left. You have a makeup team. You oh don't. Oh my goodness! No, you don't no. have a makeup team. Oh I'm my sitting God. here doing my own hair, man. I was like, and then I'm man. looking in the picture, and the picture's wrong. And I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to wait. Shoot, which you now do I'm this. To you do these all the time, and you don't have a makeup team. Well, You're no, Mike but, Landerly. Good grief! I know. That's the only thing I know. I know nothing else but that. <laughs> that part I know. How man? How are you? It's I been a while. Well. I am well. How are you? I'm doing well. I am. I'm a little concerned because I don't usually do things live, and uh, I'm not usually a good live presenter. Ask me questions on the fly, and I answer something, and everyone looks back at me like, "What did you just answer?" I'm like, "Well, what was the question?" <laughs> yeah. And so, so you're in Las me. Vegas, and you are. It's unusual there. So, give us a sense of what it's like to look out your window at uh, the Strip. Yeah, so we live in some condos that are sitting here right on the strip. We're in front of the Aria. And for the most part, it is a little surreal. There are usually enough people to make you believe that this isn't like a Hollywood version of post-apocalypse. However, it's not that far from it. All of the different large casino hotels have security guards roaming around. So if you're walking down the strip, you're going to see them. They're going to come by and make sure you don't get on public, you know, private property. But other than that, sometimes you can take a picture and it does look like there's nobody on the strip until the, the stoplight turns green and you get 15 cars go by. <laughs> so, but that's kind of the, the deal. The weekend was certainly more crowded. It seemed like there were a lot of people taking pictures on the strip. So you saw people with full rigs, which you don't normally see when I'm just walking around. Uh, most people would take cameras, you know, with their phones or whatever. They'll take pictures with their phones. But this time, you know, you have the 35 millimeter with the 2,000 millimeter lens or something like that. They're sitting there playing with those. So um, that's kind of different. It's uh, all the restaurants are closed. Moment of silence for that, please. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you know, I have certain restaurants. If you read the books, I go to these restaurants. If you read Christmas Assassin, you know that I love breakfast at El Fernayo's. El Fernayo is in New York, New York. Now, I typically walk there. I'll go through the Aria, through the park, and I cut across the street into the New York, and then I'm at breakfast. And they always have everything for me, and I never have to worry about going shopping until now, which I suppose I could use that as, as an explanation. We live in a condo. doesn't have a lot of room. I eat out a lot. I have, I, I used to do all the shopping back in Texas, which is like seven years ago. And so, in fact, just to get out of the house, I'd go shopping just, just to get out of the house. In fact, it got so much that my wife would be like, did you go shopping again? Really? Did, what? <laughs> you know, it was a big thing. It's like, you're always shopping. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm always needing to get out. So I go shopping this time and the stores had already been pretty wiped out for like toilet paper and, and all of this is about a week and a half ago when uh, we shut down earlier than some of the rest of the country. So I go by the deli. Now I had been on a sailing expedition with my dad and my brother about five or six months ago. Deli meat I found out is freaking delicious. <laughs> and so I had it, bought deli meat. Hmm? In moderation. Yes. Now, perhaps I should explain, my wife doesn't eat me to speak of. So I go there. And, you know, in the background, it's, it's everyone buying stuff. And I'm like, okay, man, I'm going to have to stock up. I'm going to have to eat a lot. You know, I'm going to have to eat at home. And I don't understand what it is about eating at home. <clears throat> and <laughs> so I get there. Now, they have plenty of, of deli meat here. So I'm not feeling like I'm doing anything wrong. So I'm like, you know, let me have a pound of uh, the chicken with the spices. Let me have a pound of ro oven roasted. And, and over here on the pepperoni, I'm going to make some pizza. Let me have a pound of this. I leave there with five pounds of deli meat, not pepperoni, because that's pizza. I don't consider that the same. <laughs> After three days of eating sandwiches, 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 I'm not done with one of those packages. And I'm like, oh my God, I am never going to finish this meat. I did have no real, I had no idea how long it took to actually eat a pound of deli meat. <laughs> Unless you eat really thick sandwiches. Where's the next beer? Diane Smith, I wanted to let you know that. Um, it's looking 10th of April or April, May-ish. What are those dates? 
Sam it's actually, I think it, I think it might be, well, let Tim. me look it up. Well, let, let me actually, let's actually talk about, we're going to start out by talking about what's next with the uh, Cretharian universe. And there's a, there's a lot that's, that's next. Um, but, but let's first talk about the next BA because that's, it's not what <laughs> is next, but it's, it's the question that came up. So the next BA yes. is early April. The next yeah, April 10th is the scheduled time to get it out. It is looking really positive for that. The challenge is, and I've had to explain this to a couple of people who were a bit frustrated, like all oh, these other books are coming up, not this one. The challenge with Bethany Ann and the Endgame series is that it has to wrap up a lot of hanging threads from so many different collaborative series. And the people who are working behind the scenes, it just takes a while. It's not that we didn't want to do it. It's just how do you try to close down unanswered questions? And so it's coming out on the 10th. We're planning on two more end games. And then we're going to do a, a large event. We're trying to work with the collaborators, kind of like an Avengers type of situation. So I hope that answered the question. And when you, when Michael tosses out dates, uh, I'm Steve Campbell, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for, for those who, who, don't, who, who don't know, um, I've, I've been working with Michael for a while now, and you you may have read some things that may or may not be true in the author notes about me. If, if All true. Good, All true. true. Uh, if, if not, um, you know, question it. But one of the things that we're finding now and, and that I want to bring out on, on this live stream is that we're losing control over when we release books. And you guys have all seen the whole, you know, the starting the fire and doing all this stuff to um, to get Amazon to publish the books for us. Uh, we're finding that sometimes the books publish in about two hours. Sometimes the book publish the books publish in two days. Sometimes the books publish in five days. We had one that was five days the other day. So when Michael says coming on the tenth. We're trying not to talk about specific dates, but uh, it is it is coming. Uh, you know, uh, the weekish of the of the tenth. <laughs> but before before we get to the next Bethany Ann, and we've had a couple of, of questions about the next Bethany Ann, the next in game, which which you have answered. Um, something that people have been looking forward to for a long time is the third book in the Etheric Adventures series from Stephen Russell, and that is coming hopefully before the Bethany Ann book. I'm not yeah, sure what the exact status of that is, but it's it's on the schedule before then. JIT, it's in JIT right now, is where it's, um, you might know him as S.R. Russell, but mm -hmm. yes. Stephen Russell, and um, his book is in JIT, it's it's in Q. Bethany Ann's book is about to go into JIT probably tomorrow, maybe the following day. So, um, yeah, Theory Adventures, we have that one on the calendar. It is. Yeah. It is on the. It's, it's on the calendar actually for. Uh, I think it might even be next Friday, but we're not sure whether it's anything on Friday. It could be Monday before it, it comes yeah. out. Um, we have a a couple things I want to uh, address here from uh, from questions. Mary Mayweather says, "I just saw your children's books post. Thank you for the share. I'll pass it along." Um, and Frank McGoldrick, I, I apologize if I butchered your name. When is the storyline map of books going to be updated? That's that's an interesting thing. We have there's a timeline on the Cretharian Gambit website, which is supposed to forward to the timeline on the LMBPN website, and it just apparently doesn't. If you go to the timeline on the LMBPN website, that is more accurate. We are we will eventually be forwarding everything that goes to the Cretharian Gambit website to the LMBPN website. So we apologize that the clickable um, timeline is sort of out of whack. Oh, I love it. Yes. <laughs> Rubber chickens and boiling Pepsi time. People are bringing it back. Yes. Let's let the Zahn know that. Um, I just I got a, an answer from Mike Ross. And by the okay. way, if I just choose to look up Ross, that was my cousin I sent that first question to. So he reports back that he's busy. Not that it matters, but Mike <laughs> Ross says they are presently closed and they're hoping to be open Monday. Oh, okay. Well, that's good news. Good. Okay, so yeah, and and that's Jesse Jesse Ray's from the Brownstone series. A uh, question here from Melanie, uh, Steve, are you the one to ask about when the next Ascension Myth Audible box set is due out? Yes, I would be the one, and I don't have an answer off the top of my head. We are we are just about to release the last of those audiobooks. It's 
almost done. We just need to get the audio, the author notes recorded from the two oh, authors. No, no. <laughs> we finished them all, didn't we? No, we have not done the last one yet. Oh, so man. That might are... be how come. Because Ellie has not been feeling well. She claims it's not COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And um, But I guess we were supposed to do some sort of English to Australian translation. And she's like, I'm not going to look good enough to be on video. I mean, that's me paraphrasing her. Uh-huh. Um, so I probably nice, took nice of you to share that for her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is why no one lets me on, on live. <laughs> okay. Maggie Wong has a great question here. Do all the paperback spines still make up pictures or have the covers changed since? Uh, you were talking about TKG spines. Yeah. Specifically? She, she's probably talking specifically about the first seven books of uh, TKG. The last time I saw it was in the German version. I know they line up. So have we screwed up book one, Maggie? I think book, I think book one has has been changed. The original book, the cover, the original cover for book one was part of that sequence. Oh man! Uh, but the stuff. others don't. So that's that was something that was done especially just for those for the first seven books. But we don't do that for the others. It's really hard. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. Oh. It is very hard, so we didn't do it again. I, um, but if we've messed up book one, like it, with the latest cover, we probably we did. Need to do it. We did. Uh, I'm, we not sure. I'm not sure that. We, yeah, we, we can go back and, and reset the um, the the to the original print cover for that. So Maggie, if you um, just ping me on on Facebook and ask me that question, if you don't have the first one with with the the spine picture that you want, and we can get a copy of that for you. Uh, next question you you alluded earlier like right at the start that there's a new Cartharian universe series starting here shortly yes i'm actually gonna have to get because i know so many people well, they're actually they a first. couple they're actually a couple so let's not oh forget. that's yeah, right forget yes so uh why don't you go ahead and talk about sarah jennifer just for a second Okay, so uh, Sarah, Sarah Jennifer will be the first one to come out. Uh, I'm not sure when that's coming. It's, it's like it's within the next 30 days, I believe, um, that that will be coming out. That's going to be a, a pretty large, a pretty good-sized book. Um, and it's, you know, kind of a beloved character in, in the Cretharian universe, so we're, we're really excited about that. Um, but the next one is a series that's coming out in like June, July, and that's going to be a three book series that we release uh, one on. The first Basically, one will come out in June and then a week later, the second one, and then two or three weeks later, the third one. Yes. And, and that, that is about Akio. We are finally going to go back in time and talk about Akio and the author on that one, by the way, Sarah Jennifer is Natalie Roberts, Indy Roberts. Which, who, whose name has been associated with Cartharian Gambit uh, quite a bit. And um, Charles Tillman, who started as a fan, went through the Fans Right event and asked me a couple of years ago at a 20 Books event if, if Akio was available or was I planning on writing him. And I was like, Charles, I have, don't believe I can do Akio justice. And uh, he said he'd like to take a stab at it. I said, absolutely. Um, let me see what you know what you're starting with and he gave me something that was really well and then he has a couple of people at least one lady whose name escapes me because all faces and name escape me and my own just look at daryl d-a-r-r-y-l d-a-r-r-e-l-l -L. um but they're really keeping him on track the j-i-t the beta readers really love it book two is actually finished we're just working on book three and so that series will come out and it's going to talk to akio during the time of, you know, after the world's worst day ever. And they're going to go through that and some of his background, you know, someone from his past makes, um, you know, comes up someone he wasn't expecting. So really kind of cool. Can you see the comments on your end, Michael? You see all I the can't. excitement about the Akio book? Ah, uh, yes. Akio, Sarah, both. Yes. There's a lot of woo in there for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I knew, I mean, to be fair, I think sometimes I just don't have the same either desire or belief that I can pull it off. And Akio, Akio was just one I didn't feel I could pull off. And so I set it aside and um, Charles believed he could do it. And thank God he did. <laughs> yes. And, you know, when I think about Charles doing this, I, I think about 
Stephen Russell, S.R. Russell, when he wrote the etheric books, and uh, somebody here just ask another, ask a question: Is there going to be another etheric research? And I'm sorry, your name just kind of scrolled up beyond us. That was Eric Blanton. Eric, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, and, and we talked about that a little bit ago. That book is coming in the next few weeks, so look look for that. We're excited about that. It's been a couple of years, and I know people have been really looking forward to it. But Stephen Russell, S.R. Russell was Michael's original editor, and he knows the world of the Catharian Gambit really well. So when he started writing his book, it was just completely true to everything Catharian, and I think the fans really loved it. And I, I have a sense that Charles' stuff is going to come out the same way. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, it's, it's true that I, my head is in many, many different stories, so, you know, <laughs> I, would, I need to go back and read some stuff from time to time to remember what the hell happened. <laughs> Yes, and, and you know, one of the things, uh, Kelly O'Donnell is, is in, in the group here. Kelly manages the JIT team. And let me do a quick commercial. If you guys don't know, LMBPN has a podcast called Behind the Fiction. Look it up, subscribe to it on your podcast app. We're going to have Kelly as a guest, and she's promised to be on a <laughs> guest to explain the JIT team and what they do, the whole world of this mysterious JIT, when she has a good hair day. So... I don't mean to put you on the spot, Kelly, but you're going to have to oh, you know, put you on the spot. Yeah, we're totally putting you on the spot. So you've, you're you're committed for doing that. And, uh, you know, once the whole lockdown thing is over, you can get your hair cut and we're, we're good to go. But anyway, I, I, now I've completely lost track of where I was going with that. Um, no, I don't know. But we'll say, hey, Eric. Hey, Tim. Hey, me. Well, here, here, Jackie, pleased to meet you. Can't wait. Renee Hadid Hadad. Uh, Maggie Wong, obviously she knows about the fairies. She's been around here for a while. You know what, the fairies are kind of interesting because you know we, we parked in the, those are the lawn fairies back in the very beginning when we talked about manuscripts going over the fence. And for me, that meant I had to open up the back door, walk through the grass where the lawn fairies were, and then throw the manuscript over the fence to the JIT readers. And they, they become, uh, <laughs> Steve, you did not go there. Oh yes, he did. Um, in fact, I, I could probably give you a, a link, Kelly, you know, the back channel, if you wanted to accidentally show up to this. Yeah, just... do you want to join us, Kelly? <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Um, it's, you know, he says at 48, you and death becomes renewed by bigger for reading. I've not missed it. Holy crap, dude. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, it just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, that's that's tremendous. Uh, and, and Eric says his wife recommends a hat for bad hair day, Kelly. So, you know, you're good to go whenever. I remembered <laughs> where I was going with the, the Stephen Russell thing. Stephen has, has been richly immersed in all things Scritharian for a long time. And Tim Cox is, is in here as well. Tim's another guy who's been mm -hmm. richly immersed from, from, you know, for, for a long while and is, is a big help to us with the Scritharian Gambit books. And Tim asks if there's going to be any references to Bob's bar in the next Bethany Ann. Are we going back there? You're not going to find it in this Bethany Ann, I don't believe, but you will see a book coming out from Andrew Dobell, who is the artist of Bob's bar, uh, the cover artist, and he has done a lot of his own stuff. So he is connecting with many of the authors of Bob's bar, and he's asking, you know, can we do uh, he'll do a chapter, we do a chapter, you do as a chapter, we do a chapter type of thing. And then that book is in JIT right now. And so it absolutely, you will see a crossover with Bethany Ann, uh, a situation there that during that happens during the end game. So that is through editing and probably, I think what's going on since Andrew is, is the main driver of this, his company will put it out maybe a month, six weeks. It's the last I heard. But um, we're not there's driving that release. There's a pre-order up for that book now. Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about a, another Bob's Bar. Or are you talking no. about Andrews? The, the... Andrews. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's a pre-order up for that now. I can't remember what the date is, but there is a pre-order out there for that. If anybody knows, just uh, drop it in drop it in the channel, and we'll let, we'll let you know. Um, Andrew, for those who don't also know, was has done a lot of the Critharian Gambit covers and is the photographer for Bethany Ann. So all of those pictures, the, all of those images of Bethany Ann on all the various covers have come from Andrew. Absolutely. And, and um, that reminds me that while we were in London, we went to a Mark Dawson event, which is a self-publishing formula live. And while there, Andrew 
found out that uh, Helen Diaz, the model for Beth Mian, was in town, and he got her to come by, and I got to actually meet the model. No for way. Really? No way. We have a picture of her. Yes. That's fantastic. I was there. That's exciting. So, she, uh, is, she is in a family way now. Is that true? She uh, is married, and she would like to, um, they would like to have children. Okay. I thought, I thought maybe that had, was already I, underway. I don't believe. Only practicing as far as I know. Okay. Um, let's see. And by the way, um, I went ahead and, and called Kelly out and I gave her the link it says it's so not happening. She's enjoying her nachos too much. <laughs> Eric Blank, Eric Blanton asked, is which of the Federation on schedule to, re next, to release next Tuesday? It is. It is coming out. It is uh, locked and loaded as far as I know. I had to do a blurb real quick because somebody who put in his author notes that we were stopping at five, totally <laughs> failed to realize how many more words were needed. And I planned on one third of the book and that one third became 172,000 words. So we are actually going to book six, which I had to write the blurb for this morning because Steve Campbell is a taskmaster. And so uh, we are coming out with book six and that, that hopefully We'll finish it, but we're, I'm already talking with uh, people and it looks like we might have a separate series pushed down a little bit in the timeline called Heretic of the, or the, yeah, Heretic of the Federation. Of the, yeah, yeah. And one of the great things about doing pre-orders, especially now, you heard, if you were, if you've been here from the beginning, you, you heard us talking about uh, some, some of the challenges with, with getting books released in a timely fashion now. When there's a pre-order, it comes out on time. So yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Which of the Federation will be out on Tuesday? Um, so that's that's happening. Um, you people over in Australia will get it first. You remember? Yeah. I don't know. You were the, you were you were with us, right? Whenever back in the beginning, and we would say, "Oh, it's going to come out Friday," and then it'd be like three or four o'clock hour afternoon, and the Australians would all be bitching. Ah, it's Saturday. That's, I can't believe you did this. Well, now it's turned around. Now <laughs> the Australians get it. You know, on Thursday and we release it on Friday or whatever that happens. But yeah, we're doing a lot more pre-orders because frankly, Steve used to have a red set of hair. That was, all this long, white up here. that was way before I met Michael Anderley. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky that I have hair at all right now. All right, here's a good question John from John Riley. Any hope that one of the series might get picked up for a TV series? That's a, a great question for Mr. Anderley. And I am proud to say uh, that with Judith's help, um, she signed a shopping agreement for birth of heavy metal back in frankfurt they had two months basically they had till december 31st to get all the scripts written and then it went a six month shopping agreement and they went right before everything shut down europe they were uh, getting interested parties on it and then of course COVID shut everything down so it's actually out there birth of heavy metal is out there it's got a script written um the gentleman who's done it has produced other shows so this is not new to him and uh just it's so cool he's out of switzerland his name is remo p-i-n-i -I. so really kind of cool excited about that it was an interesting experience for me to go through it because they take many of the books and shove it into this <laughs> script and and you know what the series would look like and how many more books we would have to produce uh, which going to be producing at least one or two minimum in Birth of Heavy Metal. Cryptid Assassin is minimally going to seven. So, Alan Taylor says he imagines a giant whiteboard in your office that Sarah, and I assume that means Sarah Nofke, changes to mess with you. And I can imagine Sarah <laughs> doing that. I can imagine the tiny ninja just kind of slipping in behind him and changing the whiteboard. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, I could definitely do that. Thankfully, A, she has a daughter, so she stays in, in Los Angeles area. Um, but we also have security in this building, and I would get on your case. You let a two foot nothing woman slip through your clutches. <laughs> but uh, we recently got to, I got to talk with Sarah and Jurgen and everybody over in London. And um, she is not only finishing her series, Espo Font but has plans to come out with a, uh, to help manage another series in that Beaufont universe, which we think might start happening sometime around the fourth quarter of 2020. Awesome. Uh, Diane Smith has reported back Andrew's book, Quantum Legends 2 is, uh, the pre-order date is June 30th. 
So let's let's talk about the author note duels that you and Sarah have. She started it. <laughs> she did start it. Thing. Yeah, see, we have proof. And um, uh, yes, I could have done stuff on the scripts, but I didn't have to. They stayed real close to it. They didn't promise anything from what the producers were doing. So Sarah started it when she said, blah, 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 over to you, or like mic drop. And I'm like, well, I'll take up this. <laughs> and so, and then the thing that got it going a little dirtier was I, in a moment of weakness and perhaps lack of clarity and stupidity, decided to share a story that was sensitive to my heart. <laughs> it was something that happened back when I was a teenager. It was a very to touching story, yes. It was a touching story that she ripped my heart out with by putting it and laughing at it in her next author notes. And I didn't realize she would be that kind of person. So turnabout is fair play. And I went and we've been having fun ever since. But I know not to share shit with <laughs> And And can I just say that I am occasionally known as the Zen master because of something that you put in author notes a long time ago. Uh, you're now occasionally known as the bird killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's true. So I guess I have to own that one. So the funny thing about Zen Master Steve, and I think Ellie might have been part of this too, um, was you know that you're always so calm to us, right? You just deal with stuff, and no matter what happens, you're pretty unflappable. And then your wife came by one time, <laughs> <laughs> and she heard the Zen Master Steve moniker, and her response was a little bit different, and slightly made us believe that off the camera, you might not be so calm. There might be, there might be something different. Yes. <laughs> um, Barbara, Barbara Davis says she loves the author notes. Um, and Eric, Eric Blanton rightly points out that you never make a fairy mad ever. <laughs> That's funny. You should mention that we have a bunch of fairy stories coming out. <laughs> Jennifer JL Hendricks. We have a big yes. one coming out this slated and then, um, Oh, I actually can't speak to the other one. Never mind. Secret project. Sorry. Okay, so there's at least one fairy story coming out, and uh, yes. that, that's uh, the first of those is coming out within like 45 days. Does that sound about right? Yes. So it was six weeks. We had to adjust it for the six week pre order. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> we can oh, talk about yeah. that. Wasn't it at one time Michael was referred to as Yoda? And who 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 came up with that? Was that Ellie? <laughs> that was Ellie. Yeah, that was Ellie. And still are. If you're in the Ellie sphere, like if you if you connect with her on her um, Facebook group or anything like that, they still refer to me as Yoda as well. Okay. All right. So let's let's talk about some of the other things that are going on at LMBPN. So all of this started from from one story about a a woman who with a thirst for justice. And it, it's evolved from all of these different ages in the Cartharian universe to, you know, just spinning out into fantasy, paranormal, urban fantasy, uh, fairies now. Um, how did all of this evolve? Not from, you know, assume that we all know about the Cartharian universe part. When did you decide it was time to start writing other things, getting involved in other projects? Outside of TKG? Yes. Okay. Um, actually, it started a year earlier than it really happened. The part of it was, you can blame Lindsay Barrard, the author Lindsay Barrard. She was on a podcast, and she was mentioning that her series was ending, and there was only one entry point into it, and what was she going to do with the next series? And so it was a, all of a sudden, I'm in the shower, and I think I was probably book eight to 12, someone there, I'm like, oh crap, what am I gonna do when TKG has only thought of 21 books, right? Which, don't do that. But I'm taking the shower and and I'm like, I gotta come up with another idea. So I ended up writing the first premise for uh, Brownstone. So I wrote the first, I don't know, a couple of thousand words. And I had built the Orsair and concept and what it meant and this particular bounty hunter. And I was trying to keep him simple. So you have the KISS you know, situation. And I had those ideas, and that's when I reached out to Martha Carr, whom I met in July of 2016, and um, and she kind of contacted me back again, and then I talked about Brownstone and how I needed another book, because what I thought about was, let's get her series out, 
And then when I'm done with TKG, I can roll on stuff. Not realizing just how big or Saren, mm -hmm. which that's been hashed to death in other podcasts, mm -hmm. would actually be before Brownstone even showed up. <laughs> and so that was the the genesis of moving to another one was me going, what am I going to do after Kirthian Gambit is over? Not realizing Kirthian Gambit would go to 200 plus books. And, you know, you said... Kritharian Gambit, I had the idea for 21 books, don't do that. And then, you know, you spiraled off into Brownstone, which coincidentally... <laughs> <laughs> You're a rat bad <laughs> Yes right. to Gothdrow comes out in like a week or two. Jackie, yes, yeah. Yes to uh, Gothdrow. That's, that's coming soon, and that's going to be, I believe, our first Sunday release. We are um, going to start doing pre-orders that release on Sunday, just... We just want to try it and see how that goes. But I think that's going to be our first Sunday release. Amanda, Amanda Barnes, which character in the Criterion universe do you feel is the most like you? And then oh, the that's... second question is, did you model Michael after yourself? And if so, you've got, let me just say, your ego is enormous if you model him after yourself. I, I did not. And it was <laughs> funny because the first fan who said, that's really ballsy of you to name a character after yourself. <laughs> that was the Eureka moment when I went, oh shit, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Bethany Ann's personality is a lot like mine. So I, um, for those of you who follow Apple, Samsung, and the whole debacle 10 years ago of, you know, Samsung totally ripped off Apple, you know, I, I can't say anything less than righteous fury at the balls that Samsung would have when they would show you. It's like, um, you know, they would give you something to go, no, we, t where the hell is this? <laughs> we totally did this exactly our own. And I'm like, the only thing difference is Samsung versus Apple. That's the only change. And it would piss me off. And I wouldn't buy any refrigerators from Samsung. I wouldn't buy Jack from them, <laughs> you know, and it would piss me off every time that, that Samsung is like a billion dollars. That's right. Mother fuck. You deserve that. You lying pieces of, and then, uh, and then they got it dropped down to 700 million. Oh, you son of a, <laughs> But it took me a while to under, so that righteous anger is part of my personality. It's just when I feel like something wronged that I get mad really, really fast. And you know, the sense of compassion, not the shoes, that's my wife. I just want to clarify <laughs> that. <laughs> exactly, see John Piho already, it already hit. You know, you like high heel combat boots. You know what, that's, that's another funny story. I probably did, never gonna answer this whole damn question. But um, so the very first Bethany Ann photo shoot, she's in practical shoes, practical shoes. Practical shoes don't really photograph well. So the second one, we actually had her in heeled shoes. But I tried going practical, and then I thought, uh, I would do heels second time. <laughs> so, I'm so naive. <laughs> yeah, the, um, so, Eric asked if Jimmy Choo makes those, and that, that would be a question for Judith, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> that would be. So So I don't remember. I'm sure I told an author note story about this. So Judith, of course, was independently wealthy whenever I met her. And, you know, she's do, she's an international businesswoman in marketing and travels all over the world. So uh, as her husband, I really had the responsibility. My company was at base at home, and I'm the one who took care of the boys um, as they went through high school and stuff. And so this, this whole book thing happens, right? And Judith is only slightly paying attention. It's like Mike is bringing in, he's happy, she's happy. So she, she starts to learn and fans start to ask her about the shoe thing, which she is trying to figure out, A, why is her name even involved in this? Because she's kind of a private person. That's changed. And... <laughs> <laughs> yes, as she travels around to conferences now and gives talks. <laughs> Guess what, sweetheart? <laughs> um, but, but, uh, shit, where's my? Oh, so we were out, we were in the Dallas Fort Worth area this back when we lived over there, and we were near Louboutin shoes. Now, I didn't know how expensive Louboutin shoes, I just knew that Judith liked them, they were expensive. And all of a sudden, she decides out of no particular reason at all that since Bethany Ann had these shoes, she should have a pair. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> so since we were so close to it, we went there and she ended up buying two shoes, two pairs of shoes. I, to this day, I do not know what the cost was, 
but I do know that Judith has pulled me into the TV to point out on the talk, the Asian lady, um, Wong, Maggie Wong or something, was wearing the same shoes Judith owned. I, I don't want to know how much those shoes cost. So after that, um, I went to go have a root beer float to get over the fact she bought herself two pairs of Luca tin shoes. Okay, a uh, couple couple of questions here that I'm going to just hit you with quickly so that things are coming quickly. I don't want them to scroll by and miss them. First, is BA ever coming back to Earth? And would it be in the uh, Age of Magic timeline that it would happen since so much time has passed? And then we've got a question about the Animus universe after that. Um, BA comes back in the Avengers, which is after Endgame. Think of it as Checkmate, if you, you follow chess. And uh, Animus, it's a good question. Joshua is about one third of the way through the last book of the Animus series, and it probably would depend on fans, you know, if they want to see more in it. Joshua is going to write a new series in, in the universe that we're co creating. And as his father, I'm trying to also teach him some aspects of it. So it's really weird to work with a collaborator that's not your son <laughs> versus a collaborator who is. And the older Joshua gets, the more amenable he is to listening to me, I have found out. So uh, maybe I just need to wait five or 10 years and then try with some of the other kids. So the answer is I don't know. <laughs> All right, a, a, lot of, a lot of the way in which your readers know you has come through your author notes. What was the original thinking behind the idea of the author notes and <laughs> spin it forward four years to now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the bane of my writing existence. Um, you know, I'm trying to give the right person credit. John, oh, help me out here in the notes. He writes the um, the vampire series. Oh, uh, shoot. I used to read him so much. He, he's wide. Um, anyway, maybe it'll come to me in this. He had just a short little blurb about the fact that he was like a dentist or a doctor or something in these stories. And he decided when reading, um, what's the, the vampire story where the vampire sparkled? You know, the werewolf, the vampire, and the girl. Come on, you know this. It was a freaking movie. Bella, whatever. Twilight? Yes. Woohoo! So he was score reading. Yes, yeah. yeah, score one for the white guy with the white hair. And so at what the, the point was of this is he gave me just like a paragraph of information about why he wrote what he did. And it, it, I sensed a connection, like a closer connection that I want to have than if a person said, you know what, I've got two dogs, I've got 2.3 kids, and we live in Massachusetts and blah, blah. Conroe, yes, John Conroe, thank you, uh, Chelsea. So, uh, which is the first one I saw. <laughs> um, so from that perspective, when I wrote my first book, I'm like, okay, I'm at the end. I really liked what he did. Let me write some. And if this book totally effing sucks, maybe they'll like me enough not to trash me in the reviews. Please, God, my feelings would be crushed. <laughs> um, so that was, in fact, the, the genesis of starting them. And then they quickly became something where... Um, I was replying because we would have conversations in Facebook with a few fans, and then I would wrap up some of those conversations in the author notes just two or three days later, and the book would come out. I mean, they were just on the spot, and that became a thing where fans would really connect, and we were all working together through this trying to understand, and there was a, um, something special about it, and then. I started sharing that feature with authors back in 2015, 2016, and we saw a lot of people also do that. And so that's where it started. Now, fast forward four years, I've done 600 of these bleepity bleep things. <laughs> and I've had, to, yeah, shut up, you love this. <laughs> You're like, you got this maniacal laughter on Sunday evenings. Here are the author notes you have this week. <laughs> so I've got, I had to go through some of these because so many, items are going through and I'm like what haven't I talked about before and then I'm like okay let me do a diary for the week because I started to realize well people might read book a but they'll never read B or C or D that come out the same week so let me do a diary for the week and then I'll say something that's pertinent to this book and I think that particular style is working all right because then I can do a much longer 
um, uh, explanation of the week. And then I can do three or four paragraphs that are relevant to this book itself. But it really has been a challenge. And I do appreciate you guys for allowing me to try to work through the different aspects of trying to do author notes and continue doing them versus going, I give up. <laughs> I surrender. Blah, 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 blah. Melanie makes the comment, I love your author notes, especially on Audible with L. Lee. And so let me make a, let, let me make a comment about that. I remember the first time we got the author notes, the audio author notes back from um, Michael and L. And the, the, the gentleman who does the post-production for them came to me privately and said, have you heard these author notes? And I'm like, yeah. And uh, it, it, they're nothing like what's written. <laughs> like, how, how am I supposed to? <laughs> how am I supposed to do my job? And it's like, just get the sound right, and it'll be fine. <laughs> so we'll have we'll have like five pages of author notes, and it'll turn into an hour and fifteen minutes of audio. <laughs> At the end of the audio, at the end of the audio book, and people, I mean, thank you, Melanie. I, I'm glad that you love them. I think there are a lot of people that that love just the banter that that you and Ellie have. And if you guys weren't here at, at the beginning, I, I did mention that the twelfth Ascension Myth Myth book is coming out on audio soon. Once we get those audio notes from uh, Michael and L. So on the reviews. Um, I stopped back around book five of the Cuthering Gambit from reading anything other than fives because I felt an obligation to read like the ones and twos and it was depressing me. You know, I'm, I'm one of those sensitive little people, you know, where a person, if I was walking down the hall, and multiple people are like this, it's not just me, but I'm one of them. I could be walking down the hallway and if I were wearing back in Texas boots and someone said, those are a nice pair of boots, I would... I would physically get a little better. My face would light up. I'd be like, I've got a good pair of boots on. <laughs> and then someone else could look at it and just like make a face and also I'd be depressed. You know, so I've had to gauge how to handle that. But that was what was going on with the reviews. And my wife at the time asked me, and I remember where we were. We were in a car hanging a left into Trophy Club. And she's like, Were you gonna change anything? I said, Probably not. She's like, Then why are you reading them? <laughs> And the few times I've read some others that even were five star and they were irritated about something, I did change what was going on a couple of times. And I learned in these big, massive um, space opera type stories with the military, about every third or fourth book, you probably need to kill someone off or it feels a little bit too much A team where bullets fly, no one dies. But if I keep you on your toes, we're good. Except I'll never kill Michael again, I promise. <laughs> Um, more. I, can you take a shot at um, the, the the Rojas name, Michael? Is it Moy Moy Rojas? Uh, yeah. That yes, that sounds great. Okay, that's 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 what I'm going to go with, and I apologize if I butchered that. But she wants to thank you for all that you've given us. Yeah, and that's that's something that you do hear a lot. Oh, you finally. You finally got that. Uh, there are a bunch of those comments in there, and I thought, oh, he sees them. <laughs> oh, I'm just not I stopping. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but I'm, I'm honestly anxious. I mean, I don't think of myself as an anxious person. Like, I'm not, I didn't bother, it didn't bother me thinking I'm going to do this. I was excited. But if I'm sitting here clicking the pen, apparently I'm having some sort of background in, you know. Anyway. Well, what, what does it mean to you? Because I see these all the time when, when people, in reviews or in, on Facebook comments or in emails that come into LMB, LMBPN, just talk about how much the stories have meant to them, to their lives, and, and how they've hit at just the right times. Um, what does that mean to you as a creator? You know, that was an aspect of the benefit I never expected. As a, I, I go back to a teenager, right? I think maybe a lot of us are like this. You have great aspirations for your life, and then life happens. <laughs> And part of my aspirations and part of my personal is I love helping people and then you get screwed over by people and then you don't know how to help people without protecting yourself. And I think I might have given up a little bit on that goal of helping people. You know, that question as I got into my 30s and my 40s, and I know that I have children, you know, these children are going to continue on. That's something. But I had, I had despaired of ever helping beyond my social circle and that was just going to have to be enough. And then to find out 
in the author side is is started sharing the back of the books things about being an independent author and then i get the first um in um the hospital and you're helping me get through this which you know was incredibly but also just like oh my god this this uh desire of my life is is happening and i never expected it and then we had one lady who wrote this is probably last year that um someone had passed away in her family and she was just reading and the family looked up at her staring at her because they hadn't heard her laugh in, in six to nine months she just she couldn't you know couldn't be happy and they're trying to figure it out and she was reading some of our books and doing that and just the humor in it and, and the people and that plus my kids plus my wife that's what i'm taking to the grave it doesn't the rest of this is fantastic don't get me wrong but that's not what i'm going to be proud of amanda amanda barnes says how, do, how are you able to keep going i have ideas and a lot of people are like this i have ideas and get excited but when it comes to getting it down, I either fall off or get intimidated. How, how are you able to execute so completely on your ideas? I have a PhD in failure. I mean, that's, that's actually the, the best way I can explain it. I'm very entrepreneurial at heart. When I was a teenager, when I was in high school, my dad would grab the sports and the business uh, in the paper. I would grab the business pages. I was reading business pages as a teenager, not understanding none of the rest of my family were entrepreneurs and that wasn't even a thing back in the 80s so to speak of so over my life from 20 through 48 i have tried and failed a lot of times and that i've tried and done okay a lot of times but i've been reading my whole life and all of a sudden i'm having a little bit of success and i didn't want to be doing what i was doing and this opportunity happened and I'm like, I'm trying. And the worst thing that happened is I fail and I try again. I was a programmer. I knew how to type or I know how to type fast. I knew how to create structured organizations. So I was able to write without having to do a lot of pre-planning. And I just, I wanted it that bad that I don't care if I don't watch television. I don't care if I didn't do this. I wanted it enough to keep going. And for the first time, that's right, it wasn't until I spoke to you, you, Steve, yesterday, I'm taking two days, I'm planning two days off. And I'm like, wait, that's an official vacation. I don't know that I've ever done that. <laughs> yeah, and I was, when, when he said it, I'm gonna be out for these two days, I'm like, what? Are you, are you going to the hospital? What's happening? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, because that, it is so unusual. Yes. Um, <laughs> Judah's like, yeah, sure you are. We'll see how much slack you. you. <laughs> so John John Hoke has got to get on a call. Um, he, he's enjoyed this, and he found TKG, TKG as he was going through a tough time, made it a little easier until the addiction kicked in, meaning the addiction to uh, to the books. And then, but seriously, <laughs> thank you. That's a good line. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, all of you, Alan. Um, you know, we help as we can help. And the company helps people just by providing opportunities to work around the world. And I, you know, that's another thing that I think all of us here in the leadership at LMVPN are incredibly proud to be part of. Yeah, and, and let me just speak to that a little bit. There's so many stories of people working within LMVPN, and, and this has been a completely organic organization that Michael has started. It's uh, most of the people that are working with us have joined the have joined LMBPN because they were originally fans of the books and so it, it's all this it's it's like a fan club inside the company and and everybody brings in their own unique skills and it, it's just a really cool fun place to work where there's always a lot of positive energy and the positive energy really starts at the top with uh, Mr. Andley there except uh, I, so I stick my finger in your eye yeah yeah ow ow <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, don't don't believe they don't give me a lot of crap, folks. We were just on a marketing call, and it was flying. It was flying freely. Well, we do and, that. As, we do that as well. But you know that it, it's great I'm to up. work with someone who who dishes it out, dishes it out very liberally and can take it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. My yeah. I got taught that one. 
oh, you think you're funny there. Here, let's try this on. How'd you like it? Better take it if you're going to give it. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I want to thank everybody out there for for joining us today, for sharing the questions. Um, let's let's take a couple of more, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Amanda says, "I hope one day I can write a side story set in the KGU." Um, Amanda, th the next time we do a fans write, um, jump in and and get involved because we have that's the way we found some of the auth the Criterion Gambit authors is is through fans write. Uh, Maggie, I got my sister hooked. Thank you. And yes, it does make you a pimp. Yes. yes. <laughs> we need pimps. We need, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> uh, John Riley, with how often the new books come out in any particular series that you all do when I look at authors that put out a book every year? Okay. So let me talk a little bit, John, to Trad Pub Books. Thanks. Um, I've been doing a lot of research over the last few years because in the indie sphere, there's a challenge sometimes going look at trad they're not capable well there's a whole related to this process of books where they actually go on basically like higher efforts so for a year we sell all those not the next is the following six months. and so they inbound because they have they have bookstores that bookstore per it is probably in the middle of books on the shelf when they have to turn around and talk to someone about catalogs and it's not just one salesperson it's a lot of salespeople so they have this massive shift that that with everybody engaged um so you know it was through ignorance that i in the beginning was like yeah i don't understand why they do this so i read a few books a lot of shatskin books leonard and mike shatskin leonard's the dad mike is the uh, the son but he's now um, getting up in age and he's um, doing a few things but and uh, Rebel Bookseller, I think, was the other one that I read. So I just want to qualify it and go, yes, they could do better, but they really do have anchors around their legs when they do this. So there you go. Yep. Uh, good answer. And I think that's going to be the last question of the day. So, again, thank you guys so much for being here. It, it, it was a pleasure to be able to bring Mr. Anderley to you in this environment and to hear, hear the answers. Um, we obviously love you guys, and I'll, I'll let Michael wrap things up for us. Thank you very much. I'd love more of these. This was completely Steve going, hey, why don't we do this? And I'm like, you said? Well, well it was at the 11 o'clock or yesterday, the ops meeting. He's like, yeah, we got that tomorrow. I went, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, what he actually said was, uh, I'll be there. It's on my calendar. Which means, remind me in the morning, remind me again in the <laughs> afternoon, <laughs> and hope for the best. <laughs> How do you get so much done? People remind me I need to do stuff. <laughs> like well, this morning's, uh, which of the Federation author notes? Where are those? I got those done. Grace doesn't know where they're at. I thought I got those done. Oh, crap. I have to get those done. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll Thank do you. this again soon. Bye.